Um, uh, thank you everyone who's streaming on Facebook as well. I uh, really appreciate the support and hopefully you can get something out of this. Uh, I think your know, sub story is a really cool concept. I've been watching a few of the videos and I've watched a few of them live as well. Um, you know, it, it, and it's actually a little bit of a hard act to follow. You know, a lot of the startups that we get that, that we see on this are, you know, well established in some ways, um, have, have a really good story to tell, um, lots of exciting things have happened. I think you're going to see today some very early level startup stories, um, some, some questions that, you know, some of you in the room might have already gone through, um, you know, certainly some stuff that people have moved past, and I think it, it might be a little interesting from that point of view. So. Yeah, if you grab the tab on the screen, you know. <laughs> so a little bit about me. Uh, I was born in Canberra, um, at 34 years old. Uh, I got married, got a six month old baby. Hopefully they're also watching on Facebook. Um, uh, I would probably classify myself as a bit of a new tech enthusiast. Um, Does that mean you're a new tech enthusiast? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> you're a new tech. <laughs> Yeah, I need to put a comment there somewhere, don't I? Yeah, brackets or something, yeah. Um, no, but, but second one. <laughs> um, so also, uh, a bit of background, studied aerospace engineering at USW, done a lot of simulation in the defense consulting space, uh, worked for Bohemian Interactive for a few years out of Williamstown and Prague before that, and I'm currently the innovation manager um, at the University of Newcastle, working in the IT group. And so I guess my question of all, out of all that is, am I an entrepreneur? Does that, does that describe an entrepreneur? You know, I think when we, you know, think about what does an entrepreneur, entrepreneur really look like? You know, what, what, does that, what does that mean to everyone here, you know? When we think about entrepreneurs, we might think of the Mark Zuckerberg style, you know, young and, and, and potentially single, um, you know, unmarried types. Um, they perhaps have been rich or at least have funding to back them maybe. Um, they might be a bit inexperienced um, or unemployed. So in that light, I wouldn't really consider myself an entrepreneur. But actually, the research shows that that's not really the case. Um, it's a little bit hard to read up there, but you know, they're not really that young. The average entrepreneur is about 40 years old when they start their current company, although I've been done a couple of companies usually before them. Um, they're not usually single. 70% are married, and most of them have kids, um, even more than one. Um, you know, they're not really uh, rich, they come from a diverse background set, they might, might come from money, they might not. Um, are they inexperienced? Well, no, they usually work in the industry for quite a few years, um, they're six plus years for a lot of them, um, and they've got a good education behind them, 95% have a bachelor's degree and, and a significant proportion have more. So, uh, you know, and, and it's not that they aren't just unemployed, because only 5% of them can't uh, are become entrepreneurs because they can't find employment, right? So, entrepreneur is kind of a broad set of people. Um, and I think what defines an entrepreneur more is motivation. And that's kind of more going to be the crux of what I'm talking about today. What's motivated me to do these things? Um, what challenges have I found out of them? And, and, and uh, you know, where's it all going, I guess. Um, I love these sorts of pictures um, because they talk about this kind of question. You know, do what you love and get your dream job. There's a start point, there's an end point, which is your dream job, and here are the exact steps you follow to get to rent. rent. Um, because that doesn't exist in my mind. I, well, I remember having this conversation with my wife in 2012 uh, when we were living in Prague, and I sort of said, you know what, I don't know what I want to do. This is seven years after I finished university, right? What do I want to do? I have no idea. <laughs> because I think the problem is, is that idea of a dream job it's kind of a little bit of an old way of thinking. You know, dream job to me implies there's a nice list of things you pick from, um, and you go through the list and you pick the one you want to do, right? Do I want to be a doctor? No, no, not a doctor. A lawyer? No, not really. Fine, maybe. Oh, no, uh, astronaut. That's what I'm going to be an astronaut, right? That's my dream job. Um, and I think that way of thinking is changing now. The whole gig economy, the, you know, you know, defining your own role and your own path is, is much more uh, the, the, the way things are done these days. So the do what you love statement still stands, um, but getting your dream job doesn't really make a lot of sense. So for me, as I said, what is that dream job? I don't know. So that motivates me as well to sort of start to explore these spaces, to, to find something I really enjoy doing. 
The other one that motivates me or drives me is this statement that everybody has loads of good ideas. And once again, I'm going to say, well, yeah, about that. I would say that up until not that long ago, uh, I, you know, I, would, I would classify myself as not having a lot of great ideas. Um, and I think that's because this, like the sort of entrepreneur thing, is, is a mindset as much as anything. It's, a, it's something you need to get yourself into thinking about, about let me look at these everyday problems and think about them in new ways. And, and to be honest, the way uh, education systems are set up doesn't really lend itself to this because structure is almost the antithesis of this in some ways. Um, and so if you get in that mode of, of just, you know, let me get the right result and get the right answer, um, good ideas tend to evaporate because you just follow your fixed path. Um, so this, this, this sort of drives me as well, I think, is that now I'm trying to look at the world in new ways, trying to expand on the way things work. Question? Sorry. Oh, I was just going to add to that and say that the ideas actually come out of taking action. Yeah. Deciding you are an entrepreneur, taking action, and then the ideas develop. I think that's a fair point as well. Yeah, you've got to start somewhere, you've got to do something, and then, then it will evolve from that. Yeah, I 100% agree. Um, I think in summary, really, I like to challenge myself, and that's what all of all of these startups are about: is, is me challenging myself in a new area, to do something new, and uh, to explore a, a new space. Um, you know, another way of looking at it is uh, Trent Bagels here did a, um, a, speak, a talk about um, uh, slingshot, and uh, he said, you know, what's you got your day job, right? Everyone's got their day job, but what's your night job? And I think this is about that challenge: of what's the night job I'm doing? Um, to, to you know, better myself to do better things in my, in my uh, other time outside of my day job. So the first one uh, in that list and in things that I like to challenge myself on was control space. And I'll explain what it's all about in a minute, but really control space came from this concept of, you know, I know some things pretty, I can do them pretty well, you know, people are interested in it, um, it's not particularly easy to do yourself, so let me start a business around this, right? And so in terms of the challenge, it was really about that first foray into, you know, how do you start a business? How does that all fit? How do you, what are the things you need to do? Um, how do you, can, can I actually go out and sell something to someone? Can I then, once I've sold it, actually deliver on that thing? Um, you know, that's what this control space was really all about. And control space itself is an XR technical consultancy and development studio. And I'll talk about what XR is. Um, but really, we help organizations understand how they use, use new technologies, development capability to develop and deliver on those um, customized applications and experiences. So it's both consultancy and development. Now if we think about technology, right, and this is going to talk about what that XR piece really is. So we start with 1.0, which is real reality. And this is what we see when we wake up in the morning. That's, that's kind of the baseline. Um, we all, well, most of us, experience this. Some of us take drugs and experience it slightly differently. But then we thought we'll, we'll expand on that um, and perhaps we can make something called augmented reality, which is overlaying digital information onto the real world in a very sort of static way. Um, then we thought, well, let's expand on that again and start to replace the real world with virtual reality. And that's what that really is, replacing the real world with the digital. And now there's this concept of mixed reality, which is integrating the digital world with information from the real world. Uh, and as Gary pointed out in his talk the other week, um, there's also augmented virtuality, is that right? Yeah, got that one right, which is sort of inverse of these, which is integrating the real world into a digital one. Um, but I, I'm going to leave that one well out of the world. Um, and we collectively call these XR. So XR is augmented, a virtual and mixed reality sort of bound together. The real reality would leave out of it because it doesn't have any definition. But um, so XR is, is taking those three technologies and grouping them into a single time. Cool, that's great. So what? Um, so if we think about technology and how it moves forward, um, if you think of that continuum from past to present, first we had computers and the internet and web pages, right? Um, so the hardware drove some software, uh, and that was really culminated in the dot-com bubble in the late 90s. Um, and the upshot of that is really that every organization now has a website. Um, so, okay, cool. After that, we had mobile uh, and app stores. So we can see that, again, hardware driving some software. Um, and again, following on from that, 
now App Store has exploded, the app idea has exploded. We can see most organizations have, have an app or, or use apps in some way. And following on with that thinking, you know, from 2016 onwards, we started to see this XR platform take off. And I guess the question then becomes, are you using XR in some way? Because like the internet and like apps, they are exploding in our student community everywhere. I like this quote from Mark Andreessen because it totally sums it up um, from, from his Twitter feed. For many nerds will use the internet, so everyone stares at their smartphones all day long in 20 years, not bad team. And that's 100% right. I think we, you know, the idea that, that only geeks do this stuff is true for first adopters. It's not true in the long run. Um, you know, over time we see the mainstream come on back of this. And so while you may think that VR is just for gamers at the moment, although I must say I don't think anyone in this room really thinks that, I have heard that comment before, um, you know, that might just be now. Are you going to be ahead of the curve, on the curve, or behind the curve? That's, that's the question you've got to ask yourself. So let's look about another way with a bit of data here. So this is from the VR Fund. Uh, they looked at the VR industry landscape in the middle of 2016. And you can see it was pretty dense even then. There's a lot of stuff going on. Um, we've got lots of companies, big companies, big names, Facebook, um, Microsoft, Oculus, um, Valve, all these things playing in this space of VR in 2016. Okay, cool. That's from the middle of 2017, uh, and it is exponentially growing. Um, so you can see not only are there a lot more companies, but there's more verticals in there as well now. So we're starting to see more areas that open up um, that otherwise that weren't there before. Um, you know, particularly around enterprise healthcare, that area has, has really grown a lot. Um, of course, as well. So there's a lot of companies, are they making money? Um, the indication is yes. So DigiCapital um, have done this analysis of VR and AR investments over the last 10 years or so, um, so six years, um, and you can see it's basically doubling year on year. Um, there's a few outliers here for Magic Leap which have, have um, influenced the, the last 12 months ratio, but really it's just a nice smooth curve upwards. Um, so expect to see more in, uh, investment in this space and expect it to take off further. And this again just lead, lends some credibility to the argument of why is XR important? Because it is important. <laughs> um, there, is, there is so much investment, so much more just than hype in this space. Cool, so control space itself. I, I don't want to go into too much of the detail of particular work we've done or anything like that, but some of the challenges that come up uh, when, when you know, we talk about XR, I tried to address just, just then, but really one of the ones that comes up to me a lot is, is can we can we easily get a uh, new development team? You know, people sort of think, hey, XR is, is like any of those other technology sets that I can just swap and replace developers. Um, and, and it's really, really not the case. I mean, you could argue, argue with any technology, the good development team is worth its weight in gold. Um, but actually, just, just getting a new dev team in on, on, a, on a problem um, is not really enough in this space. You need to have an established team that really know their skills, and, and realistically, there aren't many people out there with good experience in, in XR technology. Um, there might be less than two dozen companies in the country that really work in this space. Um, so that, that, that mindset is one that needs to be changed. Um, and there, as I said, the flip side of that as well, actually trying to build a good development team is, is not easy. The other one that comes up a lot, and as I've talked about, is this, this idea that VR is just for games, um, or just for games. And uh, you know, as I think I've pointed out now, that, that may have been where it started at, that's, that's kind of the early adopter market, but we're now starting to see that really change. The, the industry applications of XR are, are huge and are growing. Uh, which leads into the next point, there's no business case for XR. Um, we have these things about cost of platform, cost of development, um, and I think this, this is just complete and utter rubbish, mainly because XR actually creates new business cases, or creates new business opportunities, but also because um, it's a huge cost saver in lots of ways. It's a little bit about you know, thinking about it intelligently, a little bit of ideation, but realistically, it's very, very easy to find and define a good business case for XR. And then the question of how is this scalable comes up, right? So, you know, we think about XR technologies, you might be the Oculus Rift headset, or the HoloLens, or whatever, 
Um, you know, we can't go out and just buy everyone and want to learn, not everyone has one. But as we saw with PCs, as we saw with mobile phones, uh, uh, as we see with lots of technologies, um, the, the, the tech over time becomes smaller, cheaper, uh, and, and more and more people have it in their homes. Cool, so that's control space. Um, before we move on, does anyone have any just upfront questions about that area or whatever? So Sequence AI is, is really new. Um, this is something we've been working on for the last few months. Uh, and I guess the challenge that came out of this is, is really that this is a really cool idea that no one's explored yet. And I think this is something that a lot of entrepreneurs will ring through with. Um, hey, it's a great idea. Um, it's awesome. Uh, what can I do with it? I don't know. Um, can I sell it? I don't know. Um, is it worth anything to anyone? I don't know. Um, so that's what this is for me, is exploring that, that idea and that product kind of mentality. How do I build something that people will buy? How do I justify that people need to buy? Um, and the problem, I guess, that Sequence AI is attempting to solve is, is this one. And how do we communicate at a personal level without requiring both parties to be involved, without requiring presence? Which is kind of a funny thing to think about. Um, and but the flip side of that is also, um, you know, we know users is, users are visiting somewhere, like a website, um, but are we actually giving them answers to their questions, and how do we know that? So some ways we kind of address this at the moment, uh, we do it with video, uh, we do it with emails, communication where one side is present, the other side is not, um, and they're kind of static, um, they're certainly not interactive for the most part. Um, so you can, you can create this content, send it, uh, and then, then that's it, right? Um, we also use chatbots, which is kind of new tech, um, but they're pretty impersonal um, and they're quite complicated to set up. Uh, you know, you, you all have the experience of going onto a website and you know trying to work out if the user on the other end of that little window that it appears in the bottom is actually personal or not. Um, and and it, it, it's very divorced from conversation. And to lead to that second point, we might use FAQs to try and address user questions, uh, but they kind of one directional that really gives any information on what the user actually wants to ask. So that's the problem. The solution that Sequence AI present, presents is an AI-powered video sequence of you. Um, and what it does is it lets you rapidly craft these videos um, with artificial intelligence. So it's a video that you've created yourself being mixed with artificial intelligence so people can talk to it. Um, and the idea is that the world can now have a conversation with you, which is a fairly interesting idea. So how it works, pretty simple. Step one, you want to record a bunch of videos of yourself answering questions. Step two, you want to train your AI with typical questions to those answers. Um, and step three, you want to publish it and update it and track it through analytics so you understand what people are asking in those videos. Um, I can give you guys a demo of this afterwards if you'd like. Uh, it's, it's a little hard to conceptualize sometimes until you've seen it. But think of a YouTube video that you can talk to or a Skype video where the other person isn't there. So why is this a useful thing? Uh, okay, so there's a couple of big areas um, around you know, when you want to talk to someone. This is kind of use case or side case number one. Um, so me as a regular person, I want to talk to someone uh, who I can't otherwise gain access to. So you've got your brand and marketing applications where they can actually control their message to you but answer all your questions, connect with you kind of at a personal level, similarly for policy and strategy. And then on the analytics side, they can understand what people are asking about this. Um, what do people want to know? Um, you know? I don't have to give them a 400 page strategy document or an oversimplified three dot points on Twitter. I can do something where I have a conversation instead. Imagine being talk, able to talk to Elon Musk. Um, similarly, celebrity access. Uh, you know, They want to talk to their fans, they want to connect with their fans, they want to understand them, they want to promote their latest stuff. Um, but they also want to be able to pulse what people are thinking. How are people reacting to this? What are people asking me? What, what, what do I need to present as my personal brand? Uh, and of course, in the education, the oral history component is huge. Um, there are plenty of examples where you might want to actually uh, you record a person uh, who, who's, who's important for whatever reason um, and then have a conversation with them later offline, perhaps after they've passed away, perhaps just when they're not there. Um, there's lots of uh, uh, advantages of being able to have students actually ask questions of the educator. Um, so that's the case of you know, when you want to talk to someone, but there's also the flip side of it, when someone wants to talk to you, right? So a big one is this interviewing idea. 
You know, at the moment when we do interviews, we kind of hand, or resumes, let's say, we hand over a bit of paper, someone reads that bit of paper and makes a decision based on a bit of paper whether you're suited to the job or not, they might have to call you up on your phone screen. Um, with this kind of tool, you can actually have a conversation with them and actually ask them questions, find out how they dress, find out how they present themselves, find out what they look like, all these kinds of useful secondary information you get from an interview. Of course, it doesn't replace the interview, but it might shortcut the process to down select better candidates. Similarly, online dating, similar idea. You can have a chat with someone before you reach out and connect them. I don't know if any of you used online dating apps. Um, I actually haven't myself, but I could imagine it would be quite uh, confronting that the first time you reach out and talk to someone and say, hi, how are you, kind of thing. Um, on the family side, there's some pretty useful areas in, in, in the concept of you know capturing legacy of family members, being able to talk to people, imagine uh, recording yourself now for your children when they get older, um, recording elderly family members um, so that you can capture them in a state of time. Um, you're capturing those memories really important. So you can actually then, when you look back on it later, actually have a conversation. And there's random fun things. Hopefully you don't look like that guy. Um, but you're know, sharing stuff with your friends, um, doing you know, an about me or a day in the life kind of blog style thing, we can actually have a conversation. So there's a few big use cases of why a comms channel where both parties um, don't have to be there is super useful. Again, the concept of challenges um, that comes up here is the first one is the technical. Uh, you know, what's a REST API? Uh, this is one that big in front of me and how do I develop these kinds of things? Um, you know, Really important thing for me here is to understand how to do web development in a, in a good way. Um, and obviously, it's not the whole point of it, but I think that's going to be that's been a big challenge for me so far. Um, who is my target market? You might have guessed from my 17,000 different use cases there that there is a broad market here that this could uh, approach. Which one do I pick? Do I pick one? Do I pick all of them? Is something I'm still working out. Um, and then the second part of that is how do I validate that idea for a particular target market? Uh, how do I validate that? So I guess that's kind of it. That were the, that's the bits I had uh, thought through. I'm happy to have any questions about any of that. Um, have a broader chat, but I don't want to go too long. So thanks for coming. Thanks. Has anyone got any questions? See. How many hours after work is spent today? It depends how many hours my six month old spends crying and not going to bed, really. Um, but probably, probably in the order of about 20 to 30 hours a week total. 20 On top of work, yeah. So you actually, I mean, this is one of those things that I've, I, I quite enjoy it because it's why it's challenging myself, right? This is kind of my point is that if this was work, I wouldn't do it. This is something that I enjoy doing um, and, and, you know, actually have the opportunity to potentially turn it into something valuable. Um, so the, the idea that, you know, you might sit down at night and watch the block or whatever, um, The Bachelor or something or other, or you could sit down and do something useful. Um, you could sit down and play computer games, or you could sit down and, and create these kinds of things. So it's a creative process, um, which is why I can't do it. So you yeah, probably, probably, I can do this after work for, for the most part, yeah, I try and stay away from doing that work. <laughs> so how far along are you with the sequence AI stuff? So it's at a what I would call an alpha stage. So there is a tech demo video up there you can talk to me. Um, <laughs> you can you can have a chat and ask about the site. Uh, if you go to sequence.ai now, you can go and have a chat with them. Works on Chrome, caveats. Um, uh, also starting to work on some of the back end systems um, you know, around just creating accounts and all that sort of thing. But you know, I'm really looking to you know try first before I sink a whole bunch of money or retire or whatever. Um, into, into perfecting it, I want to understand exactly what users are looking for from it. But. Did you use a third party AI back then? Yep. Um, and uh, I have actually played with your sequence oh, on the website. Awesome. Yeah. Register, everyone, everyone register, go there register now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I found, I mean, I guess I know that the thing with AI is that it's only as good as the training. And I did find that you know the, the scripts, you know, this it's only alpha, but it's you know it's not really any better than you know like a, a basic search feature. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just wondering, you know, what is like 
what do you see there for the future of um, the actual, you know, the chat interaction being able to be a lot more actual and intelligent? Yeah, I think, I mean, the, there's two things. So the, the AI part of it uh, is actually the natural language processing and understanding the temperature condition and all that sort of thing is, is a relatively well solved problem, right? The, the bit that's missing, as you say, is the training content that sits on top of it. So in terms of the future with this, you know, what I want to get it to, it, it's already at a point where you can create lots and lots and lots of videos. The, the point of it really is to narrow down a particular message, right? It's kind of hard in the general site where you're opening up really broad to any question you want to ask. Um, so for the interview style concept or the resume style concept that works really well, there are standard questions that kind of have to be answered in general. Um, and, you know, the person being there is really bad and bad. But in terms of the future uh, with these kind of, this kind of technology, you know, there is already coming out now stuff around um, you know, being able to morph um, people's uh, voices and faces using text-based scripts. So I can control Donald Trump's mouth and voice if I, uh, you know, through, through a text-based interface. Um, and so you know, that's really early state of research stuff at the moment. But as that becomes more and more, uh, you know, uh, as that becomes more and more popular, then this kind of concept becomes even more powerful because then you can actually much more quickly create more and more content, thousands and thousands of answers. At the moment, just in front of the camera. Yeah, you, you, you can record a selfie kind of thing and do that, um, record a whole bunch of short answers um, and, and get the message across, um, but potentially it might take a bit of time. So it's about finding where there's, there's the most use cases that I think is the key part of the moment. So just on what you're saying there, if I'm understanding this correctly, the what you've developed with the Sequence AI is kind of like a visual chatbot. So it's doing the video stream and audio stream like a kind of conversation instead of just a text-based response. So from what you're saying, having like, if I'm on a call center at the other end servicing like one of these live chat situations and I'm typing a response, would I be able to have the Sequence AI visual um, generated from what I'm typing as a human response? Not at the moment, um, but that's where it's going. Okay. Um, yeah, the, I guess I guess call centers aren't a great use case because the thing with call centers is that the person is completely unimportant in lots of cases. I don't really care who's at the other end of that call center line all the time. I just care about the information. Yeah, so, so it's not just always automatically driven uh, chatbot response, but it could also be a manually driven response yes. and generating that visual. Yeah, and in that, in that sense, if, it's, if you're manually generating it on the other end, then then Kind of just having a Skype call, right? Um, so, so it's, it's more about cases where you want to access someone but you can't. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where the Elon Musk or whatever the celebrity access kind of uh, use case comes up. I guess the benefit with that kind of text-driven um, like call center would be that you could run five of them at the same time, right? Yeah. So it's like it's a where the automatic responses end, oh, exactly. Exactly. and then you mm -hmm. need to sort of all right. I don't know this answer. That goes into like a I need a human yeah. here, yeah. but for the end user experience, it's a continuous branding experience. Yeah. Um, no, that's a good point. Actually, it's a really interesting use case. That's a little. Do you want to write a quick demo? Uh, yeah, I can do. Actually, I'd rather I'd rather run it separately after we finish the call. Yep. Right. Probably just show it to the client. On the business side, have you worked out how it much will it cost so we can continue the road? Yeah, it, I'm working on it. I have some ideas around it, but I think it again comes back to that target market validation piece of, you know, if it's who it's aimed at, um, if it's aimed at, you know, the YouTube style, create millions of videos and, and everyone very open access kind of platform, um, then the pricing model is quite different to one where it's targeted at, you know, business style thing, of course, that we're selling to, I don't know, like a seat or something like that to create this as a platform, right? So that, that that model kind of kind of adjusts, and I think that's where it's at at the moment. Is, is the tech demo is there to try and a gather interest in people to see that people are interested in it. If they, if they think it's too clunky or, or, or how how what, what needs to be there, um, and then sort of start. I'm already starting to sort of get um, survey information back from people, start to talk to broad groups in the community who might be interested in this, trying to just um, flesh it out, um, get that feedback, and understand. Where it's the most useful. 
Do you think the uh, benefit that it will get for the corporate side will outweigh the, outweigh the costs and the effort put in? Like, yeah, no, and that's a, that's a great question because you know if if I'm uh, with the CEO, is it you're saying is it worth my time to do this? Am I getting much benefit out of it? Yeah. Right? Yeah, and I think I think you know when you think about how much time goes into crafting marketing and branding and stuff around you know concepts and strategies and around person personal brand brand piece, there's a huge amount of time that the cost goes into that. You know. Even if you just think about it at the simplest level, if I'm communicating a new piece of information, you know, I've got to do this big tour of people, I've got to go out and talk to them all. Um, a recent example is, you know, a new strategy was going in at the university for one of our areas, and you've got to do the rounds and go and talk to everyone and address, you've got to say the same message 15 times, right? Whereas the, it'd be faster and cheaper um, to just create that video at once and then send it out. And when you go beyond the scale of a single organization out to the world, then physically can't do it otherwise. Um, so this gives you that opportunity to connect with customers or whoever it happens to be relevant um, you know, in a really personal way, let them ask their questions rather than just let them, rather than sort of either having to go individually or just giving them some generics on a sheet of information. Do you have a business coach or providing a business to learn about business? As in a person? A person or any resource that you know you use to get knowledge from and inspiration and motivation? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean there there are a few people who I work with as sort of mentors, um, who you know ask questions of and these sorts of things. Um, uh, you know, in terms of in terms of a website or something like that, nothing specific Google search. Um, some books which help shape my thinking. Um, there's two main books I'd say. One is um, uh, what's it called? Lean Startup, I think, um, which is the, the Blue Book. Sorry, the Blue, the Blue Book. Yeah, Eric Reese. Um, the Lean Startup book. So if you want to know about the lean methodology, I mean, everyone in this room probably knows that book. Um, if you want to know about lean methodology, then, then definitely check out that book. Um, the other one is uh, the Innovators Dilemma by Clayton Christensen, and that talks a lot about why larger larger businesses <coughs> fail to innovate and, and how they get how they can approach innovation and um, it, it, you know, how, how they can actually be innovative as a large corporation. So the, the, both those two things would shape my thinking around new tech and innovation. So the, the party poopers like Eric Reeves will say that um, in order for you to be successful you can't keep your options open, you've got to focus. And uh, as a tech enthusiast, that would be extremely difficult for you. So, what's your, what's your reasoning around uh, and around keeping your options open? Why do I want to keep my options open? Uh, I think the the, the platform. It, I think of this as a platform sequence, um, and, uh, and I think that's that's why I want to keep it open. I don't think of it as a tool for a particular industry. So, to me, it has so much potential. That's why I want to keep it open. But I totally recognise that thinking of. Uh, you know, pick a target market, pick a narrow, narrow things down as much as you can because otherwise, how do you do anything? You know, every single decision you have to make is not guided by anything, it's totally open. Um, so, you know, I, I must say, I want to keep it open, but I can, I'm sort of shifting more and more and more of my thinking towards that closed, closed approach, or closed but narrow, narrow approach. Um, That's sort of like a normal stage thing anyway at the beginning, don't you? So, you sort of look at some. An idea, you scan around and try and find the market where you think it might work, and that yeah. takes a few iterations. And then finally, you go like, oh, I think that's where the sweet spot is, and that's where you go to prioritize, and that's where you're suddenly have your big focus. Yeah. And then hopefully, you're successful there, and then spread out to them. Yeah, that's sort of how you find your MVP. That's the stuff. That's start with your MVP. You start off with your your market research and just like product stuff, trying to work out where the MVP should be positioned. Definitely, so, definitely, and that's that's part of the whole step of you know identifying a target, making validation, that kind of thing. How do you and, and with technology like this, you know, it's taken me probably five or ten minutes just to explain what it is so you all at least a little bit on board, as Gautier said, maybe a demo is, is useful, right? Um, so that, that teaser or MVP of that capability is really important to get people to understand what we're talking about. Otherwise, you know, I'm not going to be able to go to every person who I want to talk to about this and spend ten minutes explaining what this is. That's a shit out elevator pitch. Um, <laughs> um, long so, elevator. Sorry. Long elevator. Exactly, exactly. It's like, yeah, the MLC Tower or whatever. Um, uh, so yeah, no, that's that's a, a really good point. How, how do you, you know, how, 
how do you condense that so, so that you can, you can ask that question well enough to get the feedback to know like right, this is probably the area to get into. So I think there's yeah, quite a few things going on there. Uh, Andrew Mears articulated that um, well for me. He said that uh, investors use um, your level of focus as a gauge of maturity. Yes. Uh, and that's what it resonated with me too because uh, as an early stage entrepreneur, your um, uh, focus sounds horrible because you'd be missing out on opportunities yes. that you don't know about. So um, there's a there's a, I think what you're saying, there's a natural evolution towards focus. Well, there needs to be if there's going to be a, a business outcome, um, but it takes time. Mm. Yes. The trade-off to focusing though is also keeping an eye on where you're heading because you can focus on a dead end, but make sure you pivot. Yes. Twenty hours a week of your free time, twenty thirty, is a is a big sacrifice, and uh, over a long period of time can be really, really difficult. But you have hit a point where you're working on the stuff and it's not going anywhere. You feel like you hit some challenges and you're like, no, I don't want to do it anymore. No, I don't want to do it anymore. Uh, but I think the, the you're absolutely right. That sometimes you hit those roadblocks, and you know, usually. My experience with the startup, there is definitely more things to do. You know, it's never like I'm stuck on this one thing, I can't do anything else, right? So I get stuck on that one thing, uh, I step back and go and do another thing for a little while and come back to it. <coughs> it's very rare that that one thing is a complete out of work. Um, so, you know, and to your other point about you know, 20, 30 hours a week is a lot of time to invest in something. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that, um, but it's, it's also about something I quite enjoy doing. Um, this is, you know, uh, I try, I try not to do it at the sacrifice of everything else. Um, uh, it's all about balance, of course, but you know, it's the time when it stops being enjoyable, I think a bit of time that it will be like, right, okay, maybe now I'm going to see what's going on. But you know, I, I think at the moment there's just, there's, it's an exciting concept. There's loading lots of these things. There's, uh, uh, there's a long way to go, but I'm quite happy with that point. Yeah. 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 Something like that for a very, very long time, you get to a point where it just becomes more about who you are, and you don't really, you don't end up like it's, it's not about the project, it's actually just the process. Mm -hmm. And when you really, you know, when the process becomes who you are, that problem just sort of goes away because at that moment where you're frustrated about a particular issue, you know, you'll just sort of zoom out a bit and look about, you know, what are the other ways, you know, and you'll, and you'll be more interested in just continuing your process rather than butting your head up against a particular project. Um, which is which is also where it's different from work, I think, because work mm -hmm. is a little bit work in the very narrow sense of the word, I guess, is is where you kind of need to get something done because you've been told to do it and, and here's the order you're going to do these things in, right, to some extent. Um, you know, whereas this, it's, it's up to me. If I don't want to do it, then, then I don't have to do it. You know, it's, it's my call if I want to do this and achieve this. Um, and so I'm, you know, being able to step back and go around for a while and come back to it is my decision, my call. So that, that actually is very liberating. It's probably also part of the reason why people go into this stuff or a business concept is that I want the freedom to make that choice myself and decide which direction I'm going. So you're, um, you're trying to use AI as a search function, but at the moment it sounds like, so I'm interested in the, the ecosystem space around AI for search because all, all of the majors that build these mobile phone things now decide that you know building their own AI that, that actually ends up being a game because the way you access information is critical. So if you have an AI which is trained to access stuff from a direct human connection but people are connecting to it through an AI, um, does that second layer of AI make life more difficult or more easy quite sure what the question is there, but I, I think I think if you Referring to your point about you know the walled garden sort of idea of you know you know, Google's and Facebook's are there, I wonder that sort of where you're going at. Yeah, yeah, I suppose like uh, there is a build, build, build a more generic AI where yeah. you're asking it and asking you right. know, you ask the phone the question and the phone find the answer for you as opposed to go to you and then asking you right. the question. Yes. Yeah. And so you're sort of like you've got an intermediary AI which is connecting to you. Yeah. Um, so just trying to think through that ecosystem idea that if that's growing in the ecosystem, is that a benefit? I 
to me, I think the, the investment that is going into AI definitely is valuable for me in this project because there's, there's, there's been a whole bunch of um, you know, advancements that you know, two or three years ago this probably would have been possible, um, just in terms of cost or in terms of uh, capability. Um, you know, the AI systems went up to it. So the more research that goes into it, even if the application is slightly different, there's still a lot of spin-off technology that is valuable here. Um, you know, even, even you know, as we were talking about before, the, the morphing video to your own, your own text, right? That's kind of, the application wasn't developed originally for that, right? The AI is not developed originally around that. It's developed around image recognition and, and video recognition, all these sorts of things. So they they are, that technology is being repurposed into a new area. So I think that's really valuable to be able to take that um, work that's been done there to, to drive that. Um, but the other thing is, is that, you know, one of the, one of the benefits of, of, cap, of, of having that conversation with a human um, or, or having with anyone is the data that you, that you gain from it, not, not even just as a the business owner thinking of data, but you as a user who's using the site. Um, I've got my job interview up there on my digital 2.0 resume kind of thing. I now know what questions employers are asking me without ever actually having to go to the employer themselves, right? which is really powerful because how often you send in that CV in and all of a sudden you, you've got no feedback. I'm really sorry. Right, so you don't know what they ask. Um, you don't know what they, you don't know what they, what they wanted to know. Um, so even if, even if, you know, as you say, the actual video doesn't even respond correctly, you still get the question they're asking. Um, so you still get the back end, so you can understand a little bit more and next time you go send it there, perhaps. So it's a development piece there as well, which, which works, you know, lots of levels um, for the users on the site. Speaking of Gary's idea there, could Sequence AI be incorporated with you know, Google Mini Home and Alexa and all that kind of stuff. So it wouldn't be video at that point until we get the next iteration of these devices, of course. But could I kind of record myself answering a few simple things and then my friends could kind of, you know, hey Alexa, what is Gap is? Think about this. Kind yeah, of what's Gap is still of the day. Yeah. yeah. Uh, is that a use case? I mean, that's not what I think. Yeah, that's probably yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Yes, it's a use case. Um, I, I think that's 100%. Anything where it's important to talk to a person is, is a use case, um, which is super cool. <laughs> but yes, no, it's, it's a good one. It's, 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 it's not like you're, you can't just say anything but talk to a person is a use case because they have to make, the, yeah, there's an effort to create the video to get the content to answer the question. So it's only going to make economical sense in any way if people are asking the same kind of questions yes. all the time. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's a fair point. Which is why the CEOs and celebrities are, are more valuable because you have a large ratio of people who want to ask to the people who can answer. Mm -hmm. Yes, that ratio is very large. In general, mm -hmm. means you're looking for business opportunities or whatever where people generally ask the same question or same type of question many, 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 many times. Well, you know, it's not just, just like the uh, yeah, list where the, the frequently asked questions. You know, you yeah. start off with that. Yeah. This building work. Build your library from there, really. Yeah, yeah. And, but I mean, I think that, that to do that, you know, the FAQ style style model is, is good for some applications, but there are there are probably more applications, I think, that are, that are also at a more personal level that aren't just at business or at corporate levels. Um, but there are plenty of cases where people ask you the same thing a lot. Um, you know, job in the business dating, just, just a couple of um, so those, you know, I, I think this opens it up. That's why I want to keep it as a relatively open platform. Uh, it's it's intent because because that way, you know, broadly, people can come up with how they want to use the software and have to come to the end. We might wrap it up there. Thanks so much, Ray.